Hi, hi. Um, this is AP Biology, and we are talking about Chapter 43, Behavioral Ecology, and um, we're live streaming this for some absent students, so we hope this is helpful. D okay, on my screen, those words are backwards, so is it right way for you? Uh, yeah, Somebody good, check yeah. it? You're good. Are we good? Yes. We're good? Okay, perfect. All right, and you, everybody has their group shared notes out? Yep. Perfect. All right. So, um, on, uh, on your, um, on behavioral ecology, the first thing we're going to be looking at is we're going to be looking at what kind of behaviors are like you born with, like innate, um, what kind of behaviors might be learned. Then we're going to look at what kind of behaviors are things that help you when you're surviving, whether it could be like reproduction or how you forage for food. Um, so it's going to cover a whole big realm and also I'm tying in some other things um, that are not within this chapter of resources and those are towards the end of the group shared notes. So you're not, you're not going to see it in this actual chapter 43, but it's things that I want to address and there'll be some, a few reviews as well that some things you've already learned when we talk about sexual selection and some of the behaviors there. Okay. So, um, in this, this, this man that's swimming right here, his name is Lorenz, and he did this experiment where he went uh, with his, I think they were geese, I already forgot, and when they hatched, he removed the mother, like cooked her and ate her or something, I'm kidding, he um, removed, you're like, seriously? no, he just removed the mother, and what he started doing is he kind of waggled his face back and forth in front of the geese I think and when he did that then they imprinted on him as mama and then they would follow him wherever he went so if he went into the barn they would follow him into the barn if he went into his house they would follow him into the house um, if they went swimming they would follow him swimming why would this behavior be selected for and did he teach them or did they know it? What do you think? Have that discussion right off the bat. Do you think there was some learning involved with that? Well, normally who would they imprint on? Their mom. And he's clearly not a goose, right? <laughs> But they were ready genetically, right, to whoever moved in front of them, they were going to identify that as the parent, right? And why would they, that be a great adaptation? Yes? So that the babies won't get lost and they follow the mom. Yeah, they follow the right mom around because that's the one whose fitness is going to be judged by whether those babies live or die, right? So that mother is going to provide and protect because she's trying to increase her fitness, right? Her ability to pass on her genes. All right, so part of our discussion is going to be, do we have a genetic basis of inheritance? Um, and we're going to look at some lovebirds, some snakes and snails, and some human twins. And the answer is, it's probably in the genes. There are some of our behavior. See, that's a joke. It's funny. In the genes, the junk's in the genes. Right? Um, the behavior is in the genes, okay? And we'll look at some experiments about that. So let's start with these lovebirds. So this one lovebird, it's the Fisher lovebird, when they get ready to make a nest, um, they just cut long strips of nesting material, um, like from trees or whatever, and they fly back, and then they weave that in. And then a second related species of lovebird, the peach-faced lovebird, what they do is they take several short strips of nesting material, then instead of carrying it in their beak, they tuck them in their tail feathers, and then they fly back, take them out of their tail feathers, and use that to build their nest. So scientists wondered if we bred these two together, the peach-faced and the fisher, what would happen? What, what kind of nesting materials would they get? And they found that it, the hybrids were cutting an intermediate amount. They weren't cutting one long strip. They weren't cutting short strips. They were intermediate length. And when they cut that intermediate length, they would tuck them in their tail feathers. But the bummer is because they weren't short pieces they tucked in when they would fly away, guess what happened? 
It fell out. And they'd always be disappointed, you know, and they'd like go try again and try again. And eventually then they did actually learn <laughs> that they fall out that way. So they would just carry them in their mouth. But every single time before they did, they'd always take a minute to look at their butt and then they would fly away. So they did it an intermediate. So this would lend us to believe what kind of inheritance would that be if it's an intermediate? What, would, what did we call that in genetics? Red flower, white flower, pink flower. What was that? Mm, what is that? Nobody? Really? Nobody? Incomplete? Yeah. All right. Okay. It's okay. It's just, what's today, Wednesday? All right. Let's look at another example, okay? These were snakes. Some snakes love slugs. Like if they have an option of slugs, they are eating. They're chowing down those slugs. So the inland garter snakes, though, they don't eat slugs. They just don't like, you know, it looks like they don't like slugs because they never eat them, even if they're given to them. Like if slugs are provided, they do not eat them. Coastal <coughs> garter snakes, though, big time slug eaters. So again, the question was, if we breed the coastal and the inland garter snakes together, what will they do with the slugs? And it turns out they had an intermediate affinity for the slugs, just like what we saw before. And they looked at it related to the physiology of it. And the physiology was the number of tongue flicks. And the coastal garter snakes flick their tongue more times and they're using their tongue to taste. So the coastal garter snakes were aware that there were even slugs there to eat. But the inland garter snakes did not um, flick their tongues as many times. So they did not taste, know that they were there. So when they, when they bred them together, they had an intermediate affinity because they had an intermediate number of tongue flicks, okay? Why do you think, just trying to go back to things we've already learned, why would the inland garter snakes maybe flick their tongue fewer times? Discuss that with your bio buddy. Then the coastal garter snakes, why do you think that would be? <coughs> Any ideas? Why do you think the inland garter snakes flick their tongues fewer times? Oh, where are you? Where are you, my AP biologist? Searching. Inland versus coastal. Where do you think has more moisture? Coastal. So if you flick your tongue, stick your wet tongue out, what could, what could happen to it if you're inland and it's hot and dry? It could dry out, right? So also think about where slugs live. Slugs, think about their bodies. They have very moist bodies. Do you think you're going to have as many moist-bodied organisms inland? No. no. Okay? So it's not that they are, you know, dumb snakes because they don't flick their tongues enough to know that there's something there for them to eat. It's not adaptive for them to do that, right? Remember, we just finished natural selection, and you're going you're gonna to select those traits that increase your fitness. So if your tongue is dried out, you know, maybe you're losing too much moisture, so you have fewer tongue flicks, all right? Um, let's look at another scenario. Okay, um, these are twins. Um, they were separated at birth. Now, I want to tell you something about this um, separation. Um, I don't know, I don't remember, I read the article about them, but it was, they could have been placed together because, you know, these days if you have a family and they're going to be adopted, you usually place them in the same home, right? But this um, social worker purposely had them placed in two different homes that weren't that far apart so that he could do experiments and compare and contrast what they did right? Hashtag evil scientist, right? And it was one of those situations where, um, I mean, I, I'm not adopted. Uh, well, I guess I am adopted because I, I had a stepfather, right? And if you, you want to know who your parents are at some point. You want to know where you come from. Do you have any family, right? And everybody expresses that. And if you are adopted as a child, like say where you did the type of adoption where the, the, the mother gives up all rights to whoever adopts because they don't want their, you know, and then you can put a request out there like, I would like to know who my, my parents are. And if the mom has done the same thing, then you can actually meet your parents, you know, of a fairly young age, I think like 16 or something like that. Don't quote me on that because I'm not 100% sure. But these, 
women, when they were kids, expressed that desire. Like, I want to know. But he didn't want them to know because he didn't want them to know about each other because he wanted to continue to study them. So when they, they lived, like, not even miles from each other, I think, in New York, because he wanted to be able to visit both of them and take da data down. Um, when they found out, I think they sued him. Is what came out of it. And one thing that was funny is there was a um, movie that was their favorite movie, and it was called Wings of Desire. When I was reading the article, I'm like, what's this movie? Like, it sounded like it might be inappropriate, right? And um, so I went and looked it up, and I found the movie poster because I'd never even heard of it. And um, that's just kind of ironic that a movie that's not, it's not like it was Star Wars or something that everybody has ever heard of, or Lord of the Rings or Pride and Prejudice, my favorite movie of all time. But they, you don't even probably have heard of that movie, and yet this was both of their favorite movies. They have done studies with twins, especially older twins where, you know, back in the day, like people that are 70 and 80 years old right now, if a family was broken up and they needed family, they didn't work that hard to put them in the same home. They just got them adopted. And there are people that had the same profession, like they're both truckers. They both smoke the same cigarette. They both married nurses. One of their children is named the same name. And so you wonder, how does that come about, you know? Um, and so there's a lot of research out there on twin studies. Now, on that note, sometimes you have twins that really enjoy being twins. And over the course of years, I, I, of teaching of 32 years, that I've met a lot, I've had a lot of twins. Um, and some of them are very much like in tune and they do a lot of things together. Then you have some times where you have twins and they purposely go apart from each other because they don't like that idea of being a twin. And I can remember my very first year teaching, I had these twin boys and it was literally good twin and evil twin. And I, I felt so bad because I understand they were trying to own their own identity. And so one was like literally perfect, always, you know, can answer every question, every homework assignment. The other one at that time, this is like 1989, was like super goth, you know, and not that you can't be, but he was like epically goth and epically rude in class. And you're just like, why are you doing this? You know, please provide your own identity, you know, separate from the twins. So um, there are times that you could look to see like, the way you might, uh, siblings, they might cock their head the same way or look the same. You know, there are different things that maybe you notice in your families where you're like, we do that. Now, do you do that because you were raised together or is it genetic? You know, do you hold yourself the same way? Do you walk the same way because you had it modeled for you or because it's in your DNA? Things like this, these types of evil twin studies, you start to think, you know, it's probably in your DNA. Okay. Here's another one um, related to physiology. This is a plisia. Um, it is a like a slug that's in the water. And to lay eggs, it's like a huge deal. It will lay like a million eggs, and they kind of slime out of them. Her, and they. <laughs> But they want to protect it. They don't want to. It's like a million eggs. You don't want a long ribbon of that. So it like does this thing where it grabs it and like whips it around, whips it around, and like gets it into a ball. And so what I'm telling you there, it takes a whole lot of energy to generate the eggs and also takes a whole lot of energy to whip that egg strip around so you can get it all together. And what they have found is if you just give them an injection of egg laying hormone, they will go through that whole process even though they haven't made it. So it's like that egg laying hormone is what triggers that behavior of laying eggs, not the fact that they made it and now you're gonna lay it. You can override that altogether, okay? Um, here's another one um, with mice. And let's not make any judgments about our mothers right now, but it looks like there's a mothering gene. And this particular gene if it is not like normal mothering behavior with a, a mouse and its baby mice is like if one wanders off it brings it over there's also some hovering that takes place where they you know keep the little baby mice warm and all of that but if they're i think it's look on the notes and is it did i say fos b fos b gene i can't remember um so that fos b gene if it's inactive or missing like if one of the babies wanders off, you know, she's just like, oh, well, poor choices. She doesn't go and get it. And she doesn't like hover over them to protect them. She's like, peace out. And so 
that is, you know, there's several behaviors associated with mothering. And so maybe the type of mother you are could in, in part be genetic, right? Or maybe it's learned, right? There are things um, that you see in your parents that you probably appreciate. And there are things that you don't appreciate, right? That you say, I'm gonna do differently. Uh, and, and then I'm gonna, I'll tell you a funny story about that one. Like my mom is like, she, I, I was a good kid. I, I wasn't rebellious, I was, I was a good kid. But it's like, there was always like, you'll just do this because I said kind of a thing. So when I had my first son, Caleb, I was like explaining everything to him. And I remember my mom like kind of like, she didn't interfere with my mother, my mothering, but she'd be like, what are you doing, Winnie? You know, like that, but I'd be like, you know, Caleb, this is what we're gonna do. And this, I'd explain it. I thought I was like being the best mom because I explained everything to him. Do you know what the downside of that was? If he could come up with a better explanation, then he would just go, no, I didn't do that because this is what I'm gonna do and this is why I'm gonna do it. And I'd be like, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> and it became like a battle. Do you think I did that with my second son, Jacob? No, no. I would just be like, we're doing this, you know, and this is why we're doing it. And then they had to learn to do it. And, I, and it took me a while. So sometimes there's things about your parents you do appreciate, some things you don't appreciate. You don't know that they're doing that for your own good, right? So if they say, hey, your grades are here, so you're not going out and I want you to study. You might resent it at that time, but later you might appreciate it. <laughs> By the way, I have you covered. I know you want to go somewhere Saturday night, don't you? Yeah. I know. I already encouraged that. You owe me. Yeah, we're going to talk. All right. Um, what? So, um, anyway, so... I think it's just interesting that it could be genetic, you know, like, I don't think you should tell your mom, like, you're a bad mom, probably you have some bad genes, you know, what's going on with your boss BG? But there could be something connected there. All right, so let's get some notes on that. So experiments that suggest, and can somebody please Google in the meantime, I need to show a video, and before when I've showed videos, then they'll say that that's content that I'm jacking. Can I pause this in the middle of this? Can I pause it and return? Can somebody find out how I do that? Because I don't know how to do that. Um, experiments suggest that behavior has a genetic basis. So you have the nesting, building, lovebirds. You have all that. If behavior is genetic, then breeding birds that carry nesting material differently, blah, 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 should produce a hybrid. And it did. You have food choice and garter snakes on your notes. And then intermediates responded as such. Turns out to be the number of tongue flicks and the ability to taste slugs. Is somebody finding out for me if I can pause this? I don't know if it's maybe these three little dots down here. What? Yeah, come look at it. Come look at it. I think it might be these three little dots, but I'm yeah, not sure. Okay, I'm going to keep going on the notes, though. Um, twin studies. Uh, no. That were separated at birth <laughs> so that they have similar food preferences, activity patterns, and even select mates with similar characteristics. No, you have to just stop it, I think. I don't think you can pause it. You I definitely can't pause it. Can pause it. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, we'll just do it in parts. Okay. Um, and then on ant... I wanted to differentiate the two. The first, the first three were all experiments with quantitative data. Okay, but this one, the next one are just studies, so they're making observations. Okay, why is that showing me in different colors? Why is that there? Can you make that go away? Okay, good. All right. Is it back? Yeah. Okay. And then the, under the animal studies, egg laying behavior, marine snails, egg laying hormone will cause animals to lay more than a million eggs, even if they haven't made it. And nurturing behavior in mice, maternal behavior, crouches over young, retrieves them if wandering, is dependent on boss B alleles being present and activated. Being present and activated. Okay, <laughs> then um, the next um, thing I want to ask you is, are you stressed out? Yeah. Yes. Okay, I'm going to show you a video on that, but real quick, before I show you the stressed out video, let me ask you questions about this, and then I'll go back to, are you stressed out? 
So if you're at home, um, if you're at home right now, you can go to Hello Smart. And on Hello Smart, you just need to put in our code, and then you can play along with these questions. Okay, so I'm gonna remove you. So that's the code right there. You need to go into Hello Smart. Okay, what do you want to go in today as your favorite rainy day activity that I would want to hear about? Nothing. <laughs> oh. Favorite rainy day cyber truck. I think we've done this before. Oh, sorry. If you were somewhere else and you just I'm so sorry. You you be that cyber truck. Sorry. <laughs> I think it's really wrong. Read a book and drink tea. I'm so in. If that involves also making chocolate chip cookies, turning yes. on the fireplace, I mean, and binge watching something. I mean, binge watching chocolate chips. That's good. Really? I challenge you. My chocolate chip cookies are pretty darn good. Oh, mine did have chocolate chips. Oh, yes. Tomato, Susan, grilled cheese. The creepy guy watching him make it. Okay, the rest of you hurry up and get in so we can start. Again, hello smart. And all the numbers appear forward facing on the video. They're not backwards. Guy, it's so weird to me. Because in my view, they're backwards. All right, here we go. Okay, guys, you ready? Oh, it's one question. Easy peasy. Ah. Egg laying hormone causes snails to lay eggs, implicating which system in this behavior? That would be the endocrine system, because that's a hormone, and hormones are part of your endocrine system. All right, so I don't know. It might cut us out while we're watching this video. Um, maybe if I jump in every once in a while, it won't always notice it, um, so I can keep playing it, and we don't have to do it in parts. All right. So how... Um, can you half mast your um, Chromebooks? <laughs> Are you sleeping restlessly, feeling irritable or moody, forgetting little things, and feeling overwhelmed and isolated? Don't worry, we've all been there. You're probably just stressed out. Stress isn't always a bad thing. It can be handy for a burst of extra energy. And That's not all, though. Cortisol can literally cause your brain to shrink in 
size. Too much of it results in the loss of synaptic connections between neurons and the shrinking of your prefrontal cortex. The part of your okay, you might want to just watch this video yourself. I'm just blocking it so it, the video doesn't stop. Okay. It also leads to fewer new brain cells being made in the hippocampus. So far, so this good. means chronic stress might make it harder for you to learn and remember things, and also set the stage for more serious mental problems like depression and eventually Alzheimer's disease. The effects of stress may filter right down to your brain's DNA. See, you can tell your teachers you're causing me to have Alzheimer's. <laughs> listen, listen. Plays a part in determining how that baby responds to stress later in life. The pups of nurturing moms turned out less sensitive to stress because their brains developed more cortisol receptors, which stick to cortisol and dampen the stress response. The pups of negligent moms had the opposite outcome, and so became more sensitive to stress throughout life. These are considered That's really sad. Epigenetic inheritance, peeps. Epigenetic changes caused by one single mother rat were passed down to many generations. So you can have stressed out children. In other words, the results of these actions were impaired. It's not all bad news, though. There are many ways to reverse what cortisol does to your stressed brain. The most powerful weapons are exercise and meditation. Exercise! <laughs> activities decrease your stress and increase the size of the hippocampus, thereby improving your life. So don't get defeated by the pressures of daily life and in control of your stress before it takes control of you. You can do it! Yay! We survived! They didn't cut us off. Excellent. Um, tell your bio buddy something you learned from that. Tell your bio buddy something you learned from that. Mouse. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow. All right. Whoa. Yes. All right. Someone called me the chat. <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> All right. Now, what do you think is happening with this little girl? But what do you think? I think she's on timeout. Look at her hand. <laughs> okay. All right. So, back in the day, we used to just hit you. Right? Just spank you. Little quick, little quick pat on the butt. Um, now time out is big. Yeah. <laughs> um, we could talk about that some other time. Um, so the idea is, what I'm always a proponent for is natural consequences, right? You choose this, this is what happens, right? Um, so there are some behaviors so definitely we're trying to have the environment influence, right? There are some behaviors that are called fixed action patterns that it, it will trigger a certain behavior and it does not improve with learning. That's a fixed action pattern. It's called a FAP. So for instance, um, remember the book Charlotte's Web? Yeah. Spoiler alert, oh. Charlotte dies in the end, okay? <laughs> And um, did Wilbur have to teach her babies how to make a web? No. Did they know how to do that? Yeah. Yeah. And it's like this triggers this, triggers this, triggers this. So to me, that says that it's genetic. Yes? Some like some of those other behaviors, like number of tongue flicks and mothering is genetic. It looks like some fixed action patterns could improve. It might improve because they're actually learning going on and it's not so much a fixed action pattern. It's a series of releasers that triggers a behavior. But some just might have to do with maturity and how well you can control your muscles and that that can increase over time. Yes? If you have a smaller brain due to stress and then you have kids, will they be affected by the Yeah, that's an epigenetic thing. Yeah, if you are raised in a way that is stressful, like you do not get the nurturing, 
then you too could then pass that on to your children. But remember how they said that could be overcome by things like exercise and meditation? Now, I'm gonna tell you things can change. I, I will speak from personal experience, is my grandmother, who I loved, um, she was not a touchy-feely kind of person. Now, could that be innate? Do some people not like to be touched? Yeah, for sure, right? So there's some people that they're more prone to that. Now, I, I would remember hugging my grandmother, but she wasn't like a natural hugger. Now, my mom would always hug me, and I'm a hugger. I mean, that's just how I am. But I remember my mom told me specifically at some point, Winnie, I always hug you because my mom, what? Never. Rarely hugged me. Now, I will tell you, my sister, whom I love, is not a hugger. Like, she's one, you know, where you go up and you're like, kind of hugging. Like, I can tell you, and I love her, love her to death. And she hugs her girls. But she doesn't, like, hug others, you know. And I've had super embarrassing situations where, you know how I'm always using one of you as an example and saying, right? And I had a girl, did I already tell you this story? The girl is sat right here. And I, like, touched her, and she oh, yeah. literally recoiled. recoiled. Like, she's like, and everybody saw her because she was right at the front. And she's like, nah. And I forgot, oh, yeah, she's somebody you're not supposed to touch, you know. And I was like, ugh, you know. And then it was embarrassing. So some people... Um, just don't like to be touched and it could be in their DNA, but also you could be raised in such a way that you associate touch with not good things, right? And so as a result from that, you recoil from it. So there, there could be things that are both. Okay, so fixed action patterns are things that do not improve, that they are always done the same way, okay? Now, um, where am I? Here I am. Um, characteristics of a fap. There are four things, ping pong, back and forth, oldest bio, but you take the top one. Okay, so let me, let me tell you about this in geese, okay? Geese, if one of their eggs rolls out of the nest, um, they, they will reach out for it. And I don't remember which one they did, but it's like they touch the front and then the back and then the front, and then they slowly roll with their beak that egg back into their nest. Now, you can put an egg out there, and you could have like a string tied to it, and they could touch the front and the back, front, and start rolling, you could like rip the egg away. They will still continue the process, okay? <laughs> That's a fact, because they're not learning. They're not like going, hey, there's no egg here. They just continue the rolling process of nothing, okay? And th when it says releaser, um, a, a sign stimulus is a releaser, meaning that it's a round object. You could take a can of, like one of you like tomato soup and grilled cheese today. You could take a can of tomato soup because it's a round object. That is a sign stimulus. It will very carefully roll that can of tomato soup back into its nest. Okay, so that would be an example of a FAP. It does not improve, um, and once that behavior is triggered, it will go until completion. Yes? Is it behaviors like breathing, or does that not Not really. Breathing? That's part of your autonomic nervous system where it's constantly doing that. It's not something, I wouldn't call that necessarily a FAP. So if it's not a behavior, it's not a FAP? Like, like yeah, it's, it's, yeah. But... All of these things are behaviors, right? Physiological things are behavior. I just have never heard breathing as one of one of those, but I understand what you're saying, yeah. Okay. Um, now, and the reason probably I would say that is because if you're passed out, you'll still breathe, right? But she's not going to do egg rolling if she's passed out. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. that, but she's still going to breathe. All right. Um, <laughs> Um, fixed action patterns, uh, mini mating dances, and we talked about this with sexual selection, um, carried out by birds are examples of fixed action patterns. In these cases, the sign stimulus is typically the presence of the female. And I can't remember the name of this bird, I wish I could, but um, the males take care of the nest. And so if a female um, wants to lay an egg, 
and a male is already on a nest, she will go over and start attacking the nest and trying to kill the eggs um, of the one that he's raising already, the eggs that he's sitting on. And he'll be like defending it and trying to get her away from his nest and she'll just go over there and you'll watch her. She'll peck it and there'll be like baby birds and she'll like whip them up and tear them up and it's like the babies and birds are dead. But then she will, and so he's like, I was in charge of them. But then she will present herself to him and he can't help it. That's a releaser for him. He will go and mate with her, even though she just killed his babies. She, he will go and mate with her. She will lay eggs and he will take care of those babies as a result of that. Okay, so that's an example of a, a sign. And you've been so So, um, learning is a change in behavior brought about by experience. Okay, that would be learning. So, let's get your notes on that. A FAP, a behavior that is always performed the same way in response to a sign stimulus. Oh, I skipped a little video here. For example, male stickleback fish um, aggressively defend a territory against anything that has red color because that's typically found on male sticklebacks. Um, and I'll show you a video about that, a really goofy one. And then learning, a durable change in behavior brought about by experience. Okay. So do you see how I have stickleback? Mm -hmm. Okay, I want you to see that for a minute. So just watch, he's showing you these are the different models that he's going to use. Um, so here's his fish tank. So that's a male with his red. Is he responding to this model? No. is called habituation. Now, if you go to the zoo and you see a lion at the zoo and you're standing out, you could be like, hey, lion, you know, rawr, you know, and what, is the lion going to even look at you? No. no. He knows because he's tried multiple times before and he could never get through. Like, I can never eat them, you know, but if you went out on a safari somewhere and you're like, hey, lion, Okay, they're going to be, you know, and boom, and take you out, right? So the lions at the zoo have been habituated, like nothing's going to happen, okay? I can't, they learn nothing is going to happen if I go and attack. My instinct is to attack, but nothing is going to happen if I go and try to attack them. Um, I will tell you, um, deer in hunting season in Paso behave totally different than in non-hunting season. Okay, and they, they behave differently because they know you can't shoot me right now, you know. Now, do they know that? Like, they're like, you don't have a permit. You know, they don't, but they know during that time nobody has been killed. But if they are getting killed, then obviously they learn and they run away more, right? Does that make sense? So that's habituation. Why is that important for survival? Because we are creatures that live to detect change. 
And if there's something that changes, we want to be <laughs> hyper aware from that because that could affect our fitness, right? But if it stays the same all the time, we don't want to keep processing that information. You get habituated with smells. You might go into somebody's house um, and they cook differently than you, a different culture than you, and you're like, whoa, you know? But that same, somebody else who's used to those, those flavors or smells walks in, they're like, what? I don't smell anything, right? Somebody who lives next to an airport, right? They start to not even hear the airplanes or the train anymore because they've been habituated to it because our body learns to dismiss, dismiss, dismiss. But somebody who's going to visit might be, oh my gosh, how do you stand it? I can't stand these planes. So that would be an example of habituation. So on, oh yeah, no, we're good. Keep going. Okay, take a look at this. Food learning, it, this is what baby goals do, is they peck on their parents who they've imprinted on their beak, and then that parent will regurgitate because their beak being stroked or pecked is a releaser for them to regurgitate their food, which they then feed the baby. And if you look at their pecking, it looks like the accuracy is improving. Look, at, when they do it on a model, here's their accuracy, and then two days later, here's your, their accuracy. So it improves. And that, is it because their motor, motor skills are improving, so they're just doing better because they control their neck more? Or are they learning what their mom, you know, in order to trigger the response from their parent better? So on your notes on there, instinct and learning, baby goals, um, checks increase their pecking accuracy as they aged and their motor skills improved more a factor of learning. Now, imprinting, what I talked to you about Lorenz and his geese, um, baby birds, they've done a lot of studies on birds. They will follow the first object that they see after they hatch. That's their sensitive period. Later they won't, just early on they will. And that is an example of imprinting. Um, let's see if I had this other one on here. No, I don't. So let me talk to you about another example of imprinting is olfactory imprinting. This is with salmon. Salmon, when they leave their home stream where they hatch, right, they'll go, not all of them, but the majority of them go out into the ocean for maybe two, three, four years. And then they go back. They've been out swimming in the open ocean two, three, four years. Then they find their way back to the river that they swam out of to go into the ocean and all the way follow every tributary back to where they first hatched. I can't find my car when I come out of the grocery store, you know? And I'm sitting there going, with my groceries going, where's the car, you know? And I'm sitting there going, click, 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 you know, making my horn honk or something because I'm the dumb that can't find their own car. These are salmon that have been away from their home stream for a few years and they can find it and swim their way back. And the reason is they smell their way back. They are smelling their way back. And this is why pollution can be so bad because pollution in those waters can change the chemistry of the water and for their ability to find where they need to swim back. So that is an example of imprinting. And birds, they will, for their song learning, if um, during their a critical time in their development, if their parents sings the song that they need to sing and learn in order to interact with their species, then they will learn it at that time. But they have found that tapes played during their sensitive period, they can learn it as well. And an adult tutor at any time, they can learn it. But if they don't hear the songs, they can still make noise, but it doesn't sound correct. It's not the right pattern. And I would say this is similar to somebody who is deaf, right? They can study a mouth and try to make the right sounds, but somebody who is completely deaf because they can't hear their own voice, right? They don't ever speak it the same way as a hearing individual. Do you agree with that? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like they sing the song incompletely unless they've been trained. So the conclusion is that social interactions um, apparently assist in the learning process. So on your imprinting, it is a form of learning that involves a sensitive period, which is usually the only period during which a particular behavior develops. And social interactions must assist in the learning process. Social interactions must assist in the learning process. All right. Next, um, associative learning. Okay? So 
let's say there's a shot that we can give somebody that makes them super, super nauseous. Okay, like you want to just throw up and throw up. Here is a naughty child prone to violence. Okay, and what if when he starts to be violent, you give him that shot, and so then he gets really what? Sick. sick. Then you will associate being violent with getting sick, and so you will not repeat that behavior. Okay? You're associating two things together. I'm not saying you should do that for parenting, okay? <laughs> Somebody doesn't have the FOSS BG, maybe that's what they would do, I don't know. But you see this played out with birds and monarch butterflies. So if they eat the monarch butterfly, they're like, oh yeah, a butterfly, and he eats it. Now he's like, Bleh. okay, and he's throwing it up. So he learns not to eat the monarch butterfly because they don't taste good. That is associative learning. So underneath um, associative learning, oh, do I owe you social interactions and learning? No. Oh, good. Associative learning is a change in behavior that involves an association between two events. Okay. Now we're going to learn two different types of associating lear associative learning, classical conditioning and off-round conditioning. Now, classical conditioning is Pavlov's dog. Now, have you heard of Pavlov's dog? Okay, talk about it with your bio buddy. Um, not it. Okay, go. Talk about what happened with Pavlov's dog. So whenever like he would reset his behavior, so whenever this one certain sound came up, Jim would get ready. So then at some point he stopped getting ready. So I was just ready for the main thing. Because he was so used to. Okay, so if you don't know, and this is a really nice cartoon, if you want to Google the actual Pavlov's dogs, it's kind of gruesome how he collected the amount of saliva there on the side of the mouth. But, um, so this is just like, it looks like he's eating spaghetti. You know, it's not like that. So normally, if a dog saw food, and they're like, yay, you know, food, and they start generating saliva, they're all excited. So that's why it's called an unconditioned response to an unconditioned stimulus. But then what Pavlov started doing is before the food came out, he would ring a bell. And at first when the bell was rung, the dog's like, what? Right? But then the dog learned, he got conditioned, food comes after the bell rings. So eventually the bell would just have to be rung. Okay? That's your conditioned stimulus. And you got that conditioned response where he would immediately salivate. You could take food out of the picture. You just ring the bell and he would do that. Some of you know this with your own dog. If you keep your leash in a certain place in your house, right? And if you go anywhere near the closet where the leash is, your dog's like, I am ready because it knows the leash is there and we are going for a walk. And so they're very excited about that. So this is called the classical conditioning. And um, it's a physiological response um, to some sort of stimulus. And so the stimulus comes first and the physiological response comes second in classical conditioning. So you've got four box, or um, let's see, I would like actually slate to do the odd numbers and blue to do the even numbers in, you know, one, two, three, four, go. <laughs> Okay, and then here's a little cartoon for you. Hopefully you appreciate the irony. So the dog is saying he's conditioning Pavlov. If he drools, he can get Pavlov to write in his book. Okay, now, um, so on your notes for classical conditioning, suggests animals can be trained or conditioned to associate any response, involuntary behavior, to any stimulus. To any stimulus. Okay, now let's contrast this to operon conditioning. This is motivating behavior um, with a reward and or punishment. And the guy that did this is Skinner. And Skinner did it with his Skinner box, reinforcers or punishers. So if you did the right thing that he wanted you to do as a mouse, then you got a food pellet. If you did the wrong thing, you got a shock. Mm -hmm. Okay? And that is 
really what we do, right, when you're parenting, right? And when you let, think about when you got, you probably can't remember when you got potty trained, but what have you seen parents do when you get potty trained? If you go potty on the toilet or something, you learn how to do that, you get some M&Ms or, you know, or if you do it enough times, then you get to get a toy, right? Um, this is natural consequences, right? You get an A and AP bio, your parents are going to buy you a brand new Mercedes, right? That's just natural consequences reward, right? Um, but you see this, like, if you get in trouble, you got to SWAT, right? If you, uh, I remember my natural consequence, if something naughty came out of your mouth, then did your parents ever put soap in your mouth? Now, what I would do, because the liquid soap they could spit out, I would get the bar soap, and they had to bite it. I had to see teeth marks on the soap, because that way it would get in their molars, so it would be harder to get out. <laughs> Hashtag good parenting. Um, but I, and you know, and, and kids learn how to get along. For some reason, Jacob never stuck out his tongue, but Caleb used to stick out his tongue like if he was mad. He'd be like, mm. And so I'd say, You better not stick out your tongue, or I'm going to get some soap. And he'd go like this. So it's like, I am sticking out my tongue. It's just, you know, it's like when you tell a kid, Don't touch it. And they're like, <laughs> but the sad thing is it still happens today and I say like give your computers a rest like I'll say in class your colleagues and I'll say take your hands off your computer I have like one or two kids they'll be like and look at me and I'm like what are you for you know and um but that's just how that's their little they're still in that rebellious age or like you can't tell me what to do I'm touching it I'm, touching, I'm like, okay good for you Okay, and then I want to put them in a little Skinner box. Mm -hmm. You know, okay. all right. Uh, Hashtag poor teaching. Um, so operant conditioning, the way I remember this is they have to perform the operation. They have to do some operation, and then they get a reward or punishment. So stimulants, response, voluntary behavior, connection is strengthened by reward slash punishment. Reward slash punishment. Not it. Decide if you're going to be classical or operon conditioning, whoever won, and ping pong back and forth, giving your position. Go ahead. all right you good okay let, let's talk about migration, and I'm going to hit migration also at the end. The big, the big takeaway on migration, and we'll talk about this at the end of this whole discussion, is the idea that the resources in one place um, are not enough to last you throughout that year. You need to move to another place for either breeding, mating, or certain times in your food cycle. So migration is a huge commitment because it involves travel, right? So the first thing on your notes is migration, long distance travel from one location to another. And I gave an example of loggerhead sea turtles hatch in Florida, but where do they travel to? Mediterranean. Okay, so one thing you have to do is you have to orient yourself, right? We do, do you do this? Like when you go somewhere, different place, you're like, okay, wait, where am I? And that's that orientation process where you can take in clues from your environment so you know which way to walk right and so orientation is the ability to travel in a particular direction there's a lot of studies done with birds biological clocks help with time and the sun to know which direction to travel in okay then then to navigate is the ability to change direction because if it's orientation only it's like oh i need to walk this way but if you navigate, you're taking in new conditions, or maybe there's a mistake, maybe a storm threw you off, and you're able to change in order to go and change your direction in which you go. So on navigation, the ability to change direction in response to environmental clues. And, the, and birds probably use 
um, the, the mag Earth's magnetic um, field. And they have done studies, hideous little studies, where they have put little magnetic field generators on the heads of birds and then just messed with them and just changed the field so they go somewhere else, you know, as a result of that. Okay, um, okay and then um, conclusion. Um, the danger cost of the journey must be worth the reward more favorable environment or for reproduction. Otherwise, the behavior would not persist. All right, and then for cognitive learning. So I like these. Um, can you see the baby right there, little eyes? See how it's clutching? Okay, so observation and imitation. Oh, your hair's in the, okay, there it goes. Um, the baby, well, I think these are macaw um, monkeys in Japan, and um, these are the ones that sit in those natural hot springs where it gets really hot, you know, when it's snowing outside, so it keeps their temperature warm, if you've ever seen that picture. Okay, but what they will do is they will watch mother wash the sweet potatoes, and then they learn how to wash sweet potatoes before you eat them. Now, you have this, if you have a family recipe for tacos or chili or spaghetti, you watched your parents do it a bunch of times, and then due to observation and imitation, you make it the same way. So that is one form of learning. So underneath cognitive learning, imitation, observation, Japanese macaws, monkeys, learn how to wash sweet potatoes before eating them by watching others. Okay, got that one? And now insight learning. Okay, now let me tell you why I have this picture. The, the experiment that used to be in textbooks all the time for insight learning was it showed monkeys in a room with boxes all over the floor and bananas hanging from the ceiling. And then they would show that the monkeys had stacked the boxes up and then got on top of the stack of boxes in order to get the bananas. That experiment was, is in like every textbook. It's never been repeated. Okay? It has never been repeated and probably didn't happen that way just by chance that one time that it happened. So it always bothers me that you have that repeated experiment in a textbook when it's not true. So that's why I have the monkey. If the monkey, okay, if there was a gun lane on the ground and somebody was bothering the monkey and he learned to pick up the gun and shoot somebody with that gun, that would be insight learning okay not the uh, i mean the other if it actually happened would be true but there are examples of insight learning like the classic mice and the ice cream experiment where they learned to hold the spoon over a piece of cheese and then flip the other mouse up to get them that is not true either i just thought i'd throw it in there but that would be insight learning okay here is an actual true one okay they took meat and hung it from a tree branch and so when crows wanted to eat the meat, if they flew by, they'd be like, mm, and the meat would move, right? Because there's nothing there to hold it, to, to work against, right? And so they could never get the meat. But then the crows figured out, I'm going to land on the branch, I'm going to reach down with my beak and pull up the string and step on it and hold it, let go, reach down, pull it up, step on it and hold it in order to get that. And that's, they're problem solvers. That's what insight learning is, aha. So on your notes where it says inside, when an animal solves a problem without having any prior experience with the situation. Ravens learn to retrieve food, sea, sea otter, um, saves rock to bash open clams. Okay, and here, here is this. Remember, you can join us in Hello Smart if you have the code Tricks you. 
right? Because I said dog, and so you thought of Pavlov, and you immediately said, oh, dog, then it's gotta be Pavlov. But look what's happening. Using treats to train a dog. That means they roll over or bark, and you're rewarding them with a treat. That is operant conditioning. So be careful, I do this question on purpose, be careful that you just don't see dog and think Pavlov, all right? Now, we're gonna move on in just a moment to communication. I think this is what my students do, is they take a walk around the building for a little break. So that's what I'm gonna have them do. So I'm gonna pause or stop this video and load it, and then you can join us for part two, and you all take a quick little walk, yes. okay? I hope you're having a good day. You're smart and wonderful.